Yo, welcome to Comic Books and Chill. Your place to sit back and relax and talk about comic books. We're the staff bros. I'm Mike chilling with Chris. What's up, everyone? Welcome to the show. 2021, we're getting the job done. Staff bros has been delivering. We had Chris Johnson, Rodney Barnes, Brad Walker, Brad Anderson, Alice Sinclair, the color maestro, David Barron, man. Now we got Doug Monkey. I can't believe this. We just had David Barron recolor, Man Who Laughs cover. Now we have the penciler. We're interviewing the penciler, the legendary Doug Monkey. I can't believe it. Chris, you've been taking all, the, all these shots, these wonderful shots. What was your favorite Doug Monkey book that you shot? Um, I got to go with Batman 635, the first Red Hood, man. That book Ooh. is fire. That cover is beautiful. Um, it's a good book. Yeah, I, I, got, I got to admit, that's, that's a fresh one. Fresh uh, Matt Wagner, classic Batman story. I got to go, for me, sentimental pick. The, the pencil sketch cover of Sinestro Green Lantern 1, the, the, the beginning of the new 52 run, and uh, that was like in the thick of Doug's run, and he ended it solid. I love it. That's one of my favorite runs of all time, so I'm glad that that signed, so I'm, I'm, I'm loving that shot. But without any further ado, we're about to get into the talking box with Doug, but before that, like, subscribe, hit that notification bell, please, please comment. We're the Stats Bros, Mike and Chris. We're about to get into the talking box with Doug. Our next guest on the Talking Box is a comic book veteran for over three decades plus. He is an artist that has drawn some of DC's classic modern stories like Batman Under the Hood, Final Crisis, Green Lantern Blackest Night, and has worked with popular characters like The Mask. This dude is strong, I'm telling y'all, really, really strong. Like chilling with Arnold Schwarzenegger strong. Ladies and gentlemen of the Stash Land, we present to you the powerhouse of penciling, the strong arm of the draw, the only man in comics that Lobo is afraid to take down, <laughs> the mighty Doug Monkey. Woo! Yes. yes. That, is, awesome. that is uh that's more than I ever expected. It's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, hey, you you're worth it, man. Uh, walking through this door. You said it, I didn't say it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, first off, I want to thank you, Doug, for joining us. Uh, I have a tremendous amount of respect for your work. Uh, you're one of my favorite all-time artists. I'm not just saying that because you're on the show. Um, you really are. As a big, huge DC fan. And, you know, we're going to talk about comics, but curiosity is killing my cat right now. Uh, <laughs> you know, if anyone that follows you on Instagram, they know that you're a, a big weightlifter. And I just wanted to know, where did the passion for weightlifting come from? Well, comics is partly to blame, I guess. I mean, uh, normal childhood, so in a sense, I was out there in the real world growing up and uh, bullies was pretty much a common occurrence, you know, in my life. Uh, it didn't color it in the worst possible way, but, you know, you encounter those kind of things. You start reading comics, you see superheroes, and the first thing as a child that I wanted to do is uh, not be a comic book artist, penciler, um, but want to be a superhero, you know? Nice. <laughs> uh, to be able to take care of myself and to help others. Uh, no joke. I, uh, if you if you've ever read any like some of the older interviews that uh, covered me before, I tell this little story of running around the neighborhood when I was in like first or second grade as soap man. <laughs> and nice. I took two empty bottles and I filled them with soap, like uh, dish soap, uh, that my mom had, and I strapped them to my wrist. I had a cape. I ran around looking for criminals. I mean, just weren't a lot of them. <laughs> there weren't any in my neighborhood right there in the middle of the day, and I wasn't allowed to go out at night looking for them. But I really, um, so it became a passion for wanting to defend myself and fight bullies, really. And I resisted lifting weights, actually, because I, I, I was a big Bruce Lee fan, and, and uh, I just didn't see Bruce Lee lifting a lot of weights. You know, I considered him an absolute badass, so. I, uh, I had a, a good friend in high school who finally just got me to, to sit down when I was 17 and, and give it a try. And you know, that was it. I've been doing it ever since. So the 40, 41 years. Wow. Strength is an interesting thing to pursue. You know, athletics usually are for the young. You know, it, 
as far as your speed, coordination, all that stuff, but you can get stronger all throughout your life. Recovery is the biggest issue as far as I can tell. Right. Well, let's see, some of my best lifts would be, so like flat bench, 430, incline bench, 370, and uh, standing over the press, 300. <laughs> Very explosive is what I am. The best way to describe it is I'm an explosive athlete, which is probably why I'm good at uh, Olympic lifting. I had a good vertical jump, you know, I um, that kind of stuff just came natural. So the first time I, I benched, I, I benched 230. And so that was a good place to start, you know. I always had it. So things like pushing motions were just came natural. It's not like it was hard for me. Uh, we recently interviewed uh, your friend, David Barron, and he, yeah. he told us the whole spiel about how we got into comic books. We would like to know how your process was and how you would compare it to today. I got in the way that nobody probably is getting in, uh, in which was very typical back then, it's very common, send in a portfolio. Um, you know, you could send them in unsolicited and they, the companies did have uh, people that go through that stuff, you know. I sent, I, I put a portfolio together and it was hardly conventional looking comic book portfolio. It was kind of this eclectic little story and I threw in a bunch of pinups. I, I drew it entirely sitting on uh, at the, my wife's, but at the time my fiance's um, floor at her apartment. I mean it, and then threw it in three envelopes. I sent one to Marvel, one to DC, one to Dark Horse, because that seemed to be the most logical you know, Dark Horse was what you could, what do we call it? It was like, the, you know, it was like the, the big independent, you know, they had a lot of things going on. Didn't hear back from Marvel, didn't hear, hear back from DC, but I did hear from Dark Horse. I didn't get something immediately, but it was a call from Randy Stradley and he says, we'll have something for you by the fall. So I, I've been bouncing back and forth between Minnesota and Northern Illinois. Uh, I would go work in Illinois as a t-shirt painter. Actually, what I did was I, I think I sent it in, instead of a submissions editor, I sent it to like the art art editor or whatever. <laughs> and so who knows where it ended up when it went to Marvel or DC, it just probably ended up in the trash can something. Like <laughs> Dark Horse was small enough, so they opened up everything, I think, and they just, they liked it. They didn't have something for me to do, but they put me on file. And then John Arcudi, uh, who I worked with extensively in my early days. He uh, he went up to the offices in Portland. They let him go through the submissions. You know, like here, pick somebody out. You want to do something, find somebody you want to work with. So he went through the file and pulled me out. So the first thing I did was a book called uh, Homicide. It taught me a lot, you know, like how to draw, how to be patient with material I'm not. You know, I wanted to draw people punching each other, really, for the most part. So it made me work in a way I didn't anticipate. And at that time in my life, I really wasn't even good at sitting down and drawing. I hardly ever drew, actually. So when did you start drawing and when did you feel like you had the confidence enough, the chops, to want to submit your portfolio? To. I didn't know not to. Actually, <laughs> okay, I spent, you know, I, I collected comics. Uh, I started when I was five. Um, I, I started because uh, my parents rented out their basement to a, a rugby playing college student named Mike and he gave me all of his comics, purely Marvel, that's all he had. So my first exposure was to early Spider-Man and Hulk and stuff. Um, so I started collecting right then, collected until I was, when I left Southern California basically I, I got rid of my collection. Drawing for me at that time wasn't so much about sitting down. I still drew, you know, I, I did art, but I wasn't a real patient, like sit for hours kind of guy, unless it absolutely caps, you know, like captured me. And the closest thing I could say up until that point is I took a animation class uh, at a junior college and, and uh, spent, spent a semester animating, which was a lot of fun. Uh, but when it came to like drawing comic book stuff, I just didn't very much. Most of my art was you know, just, just really sporadic, just occasionally. At that time when I got in, comics was, that was during the boom. That was during uh, Image, you know, that was during the, so comics were making 
uh, the news, you can say. And I was still, even though I got rid of my collection, I was still like on the, the fringes of comics. I knew all about it. I had friends who still collected and we talked about it. And they would show me different kinds of comics that I had never seen before, like Love and Rockets or, uh, or something like totally different, like ABC Warriors or just stuff that I had never picked up before. So that, that kind of thing, or Rangs Rocks, or uh, just a whole bunch of like more, India's not the right word, European comics maybe. Okay. A lot of them. Um, so I was seeing that and that was kind of filtering into my brain as to what comics were these days. That's why my portfolio was so different because that's what I was seeing more of. Even though I was really just like your garden variety, and like I love superhero stuff really. I uh, and, and I would spend my summers doing art. I was just standing at a, at a in an airbrush booth on my feet, you know, spray painting shirts. You know, that's what my art was. I think it was in the Chicago Tribune. They had a big article on comics, like a huge article, in their variety section or entertainment section, and it talked about how good it was, and how things were exploding, and like the money was good, and all these wonderful things. I was going, hey. I, I haven't thought about it in a while. I hadn't, it's not that I hadn't thought about it at all, because when I was 17, I, I hopped on a bus and I went to try to go to New York with a portfolio. It was a really inferior portfolio. It was terrible. I wish I had it. I wish I had it to look at and just go, oh man, you're really lucky you didn't make it all the way. That was my first like real attempt. You know, at least I got as far as the state. I didn't get all the way into the city. I would. At least I was smart enough to not to go with no money. When I did it again in when I was 23 or 24, I was way more prepared and mature. I could think better about how to sit and draw something. There's a night and day difference in terms of my artistic focus. But it really was that simple. I just threw some pages, put them in the mail, and got a call. Wow. And, you know, you get that you get that that question asked a lot whenever you go to conventions. Now I'm blaming people for asking because how else are you going to know? There, there is no direct pipeline. My way was purely simple and I, <clears throat> in some ways you look at today's industry and you go, well, you guys got it harder that way, but you got it other really cool things you can do, like unprecedented cool stuff. You want to be your own publisher? All of this stuff is available. It's yeah. cheap. Yeah. Is, are you competing against an enormous amount of people doing the same thing? Yeah. But, you know, talent usually gets recognized sooner or later. If you got something to say or something really good to do, it's, chances are it'll get noticed eventually. You've mentioned something about the comic, like the comic book culture was exploding back in, I would say, like the early 90s and stuff like that. And I feel yep. like it's, it, it's cycled back around to now where uh, comic book culture, and it has kind of met up with, with popular culture, with all of the movies, with Marvel and Warner Brothers and all of that stuff. And But with that, I think the big difference between then and now, I don't know, and you, you correct me if I'm wrong, that's why I'm asking you this question, is, you know, there's a lot of, you know, rumors and speculation and gossip. That it's kind of like TMZ kind of, uh, of of comic book culture these days and one of the big things that's kind of around that's being you know promoted a lot is this kind of uh supposed death of com of the comic book industry do you think that the comic book industry is going to die anytime soon what are your thoughts on that i mean not like i know anything really <laughs> there's so many people who like it i can't imagine it, it's going to exist no matter what First of all, the properties themselves are worth an astonishing amount of value. You know, so just themselves, just, I mean, look at you know, the Avengers have a, have made so much money for a company. So just the characters themselves um, are not going anywhere. They're a commodity that is really valuable. Comics is an easy way to continue promoting it and to use it as a developmental tool. Like, it's there's there's no way around it. The the sale of floppies is way down. You know, that's I watched that go. It was more like down and then you know. <laughs> And, and Corona, the conditions that we lived under the last year obviously didn't help it at all because sales 
we're impacted. You know, what can you do? Yep. Comics is so much, such a huge part of the of the public you know, consciousness now that I don't think it could ever just go. It might we might have experienced some metamorphosis. I mean, I people have this ability to figure ways around problems. You know, when you think of how, like we were talking just a few minutes ago, how independent people can create their own comics. Well, there's a way to distribute them. There's a way to reach the audience. There's a way to do all of this. If you if you have a, a project and you do a Kickstarter, a crowdfunded, you know, as long as you got a good product mm -hmm. and you're able to reach people and then you're able to have a distribution channel, you, even if it's you, it's gonna continue on. And that's just the stuff that we know that people are making just every day, people who aren't working on Batman or Superman or Spider-Man, you know, that's that's anyone. So there's there's no reason that the rest of the industry won't somehow survive. I know that they've talked about things like what if we just had digital release and then collect the editions. I don't want to see that happen, primarily because there's so many people who. I mean, think of what that would do to a uh, you know a comic book, you know, your L, your local comic book store. You know, that, mm -hmm. that, that'd be a real punch in the jaw. You know, I, I hope that they don't do that to an industry that has supported them. I mean, because comics is, is the publishing side. But I'm sorry, if you guys just pull the rug out from underneath all these people who have made it possible for you to survive and to sell and to prosper, that would be awful. You know, let's just keep it rolling the way it is. You know, a good diversified comic book store is a great place for people to go find stuff that they can't get anywhere else. Let's talk about some of your comic book co collaborations. You've worked with some of today's major heavyweights, uh, no pun intended. You've done uh, Frank, uh, Grant Morrison, uh, Jeff yeah. Johns, Peter Tomasi, James Tyne in the fourth. Do you have a favorite collaborator? And if so, can you explain why? Let's, let's start from like the most enduring collaboration and the one that the body of work is so substantial. Well, it would be Jeff. Jeff Johns and I, you know, you can't beat four years of Green Lanterns. I mean, that's, that was me, issue after issue, you know, for the most part. So that body of the work, I, I can't compete with that in terms of anything. Jeff was a, Jeff is a, like, talking to Jeff on the phone, for instance, was always fun and exciting because he likes comics so much. Like, he would explode with comic book enthusiasm. So it's easy to become enthusiastic about what we're doing. So I'd say Jeff, Jeff sits in his own cubicle of, of importance in my career. I, and in fact, he opened a lot of doors. You know, being, being able to work on Green Lantern with Jeff Johns is amazing. The person I get asked the most about is Morrison. And really, Grant and I have not done all that much together, but we have done enough pivotal work that I get, it, it stands kind of on the top of things. You know, like, what's it like? And, and really, I get every convention, it's multiple times in, in interviews. What's it like working with Grant Morrison? <laughs> we, we did low key talk about who you would bring up, and we were yeah. hoping Grant Morrison a little yeah. bit. <laughs> it's, it's mostly, it's what surrounds Grant Morrison that makes it intriguing because people ask that for a reason because I suppose they hear different things. Grant and I have never actually personally spoke on you know on the phone at all. We always spoke you know through editors if necessary. He's a he's a he's a good artist all on his own. So when it comes to designing and if he has ideas or there, there's some really complex pages that he wanted me to do. Thankfully, he could draw out some of them. You know, it wasn't a lot, but in design work, he could he could show me what he wanted. That makes things easy. Um, a script like with, uh, when I did, um, let's see, Superman Beyond, I think it was. Oh, I'm glad you brought that up. I thought you did a phenomenal job. That was such a mind trip, like two issue story. Continue. <laughs> that's a weird, that's a weird little story. Yeah. But that's compared to what the script looked like. Because Grant, this is, once Grant, as far as I can tell, this is my perception of Grant. When he writes, he writes a lot. He doesn't write just to put the meat and potatoes on the page. He's like spinning a tail in a yard and telling you all of these things that will never even show up on the page. 
except in how he's making you think about it. So he's, he talks a lot about stuff. <laughs> you know, like the idea of like the uh, the bleed between a page, you know, what it means, this philosophical stuff. And I would get the script and I would call up my editor. I said, oh, yeah, what what does this mean? You know, what, the, what part of this do you think he actually wants me to draw? And so we would discuss it. Like, oh, wait a minute, you know. <laughs> Uh, whatever, whatever you, whatever you interpret it from that, I gotta say, like pound for pound, I, I love Green Lantern number one. Green Lantern, your run uh, from Blackest Night and bleeding into New Fifty Two was phenomenal. I think that that's the best Green Lantern volume of all time in my book. I could be biased, but those two stories to me were the was the highlight of the entire Final Crisis. It was weird. I had to read that a few times because he was, you know, it's very, oh, no. yeah, it's it's very <laughs> philosophical. I always say Grant Morrison has the highest reread value in comics because you have to be like, there's that initial shock of like, what is he saying? Let me read it again. Yeah. It, I mean, I get emails from people asking me like questions like about Grant stuff, and I, I can't answer it. <laughs> you know, like, if you can't figure it out, I, I, I wish I had a good answer. On the other hand, when he and I did um, Frankenstein, Seven Soldiers Frankenstein, that was totally different. That was as if I got probably the most entertaining, simple reading script ever. So that was that was just a breeze. It was simple. Superman Beyond, no, that was really complicated. Final Crisis, the same thing. And then we did this book called uh, Ultra Comics. Yeah, that was. That was fairly complicated. Fairly complicated, esoteric, you know, in the read at times. Multiversity was, was esoteric. That was one of those things I had to sit back and have to read some yeah, Aristotle yeah. and stuff like that. I have to ask you a question about someone that I was, uh, it was two people, I, I'm not gonna lie, we're not gonna lie. Of course we want you to talk about Morrison. But the other is Patrick Leeson. You guys were, you guys, I mean, obviously you guys are both pencilers, but you guys also kind of traded back and forth uh, early rebirth Superman stuff. And what's your relationship with him? Oh, he's one of my best friends. I, awesome. I met Pat because he, he grew up in a town just right by seven miles away, right? And I'll try to make this story really quick. But we, he had a friend who I was mentoring a little bit. Uh, so we would get together on a, like a monthly basis and he would show me what he's worked on and I'd give him feedback but it was very redundant he was never really working very hard at it and I'd gotten to a point where I said all right I'll give you one more chance you know if you don't show dramatic improvement he would just draw right before he saw me you know, uh, like just quickly it was pretty clear I mean he and I never talked about that you know but you know, being an older guy, you know, I, I mean, all I had so much time for shit. You know, I, I'm a professional, let's not waste my time. Here, if you want to do it, let's do it. I, I can help you. I'd given him an ultimatum, one more time or we're done, you know. So he calls me up and I, he said, you know, I got, I got stuff to show you. I go, you do, you know? He says, yeah, yeah, I, I did some work. And he says, I have a friend too who wants to, to show you stuff. And I said, okay. Fine. So we meet at the local comic book shop at the time, and this young guy shows me his stuff, and I go, Dude, you just drew this, you know, you didn't, you know, I've, I said, what, what did you do? This is nothing. He goes, I got school, I got work, which is probably true. <laughs> and I says, ah, and I, I literally like pushed myself away from the table and I folded my arms and I said, what do you got? And I wasn't even looking at Pat. This is Pat Gleason. He's about 20 years old, 1920. And also, I, I see this kid reach down, and he's rummaging in a, you can hear it's a, a paper sack, and he pulls out a stack of comics about this, this big, that he's made. And I'm like, oh, and I start reading. <laughs> it's crude, it's mostly done with Sharpie, and it is hilarious stuff. It is so funny. And it's so, well, violent, it's extremely violent. You know, he and his, his good friend, Matt, they would just make comics. And they weren't even comic book guys. They actually liked animation, cartoons mostly. So his actual comic book knowledge was not like all that developed, but his drawing was amazing. 
his storytelling, his the aggressive nature and the fun that he put into the artwork. I looked at that and I, I've never seen anything like it because he, he, I think he had done like 60 comics wow. where they had wow. printed them all up themselves. Some were, I mean, I could call him up and ask him, but you know, it, it, it's a big number. I'm not far off. And some of them were like, like 20, 20 pages with nothing. Some were 40 pages, 60 pages. They just went on and on. I just couldn't believe it. I think I'd never done anything like that. I'd never seen anyone do anything like that who wasn't working in a comic. That's pretty cool. So I wrote, my, I wrote my telephone number down and I handed him a piece of paper, it, on a little piece of paper. I said, look, it's not if you want to, it's when we'll work in comics. I said, there's no doubt about it. You, you'll work in comics if you want to. So I said, give me a call if you want to talk. And I drove home and it took him a day or two and he called me back and we got together. and. Um, so I mentored him, uh, he became my assistant and he had to come down into, at that time I had a, a studio that was both uh, a workout room and, and a studio. So Pat remembers like I'd make him do pull-ups and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> wax on, wax off. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, I, I have to say that both you and Pat are part of some epic Green Lantern, right? He was working with yeah. Peter alongside yeah, he, you. Yep, yeah, he was doing core. I was sitting there doing, you know, GL, and we had a blast. Because we could look over each other's shoulder and just see what was going on. And I, I'd been in the business for so long at that point, and I was so, at that point, I was so pushed to be productive. So that, that sometimes I would do, I just, I would approach the script in a very like journeyman style. You know, I just do what had to be done. But then I'd see Pat, who was way more imaginative, you know, like doing crazy stuff. And there were times when um, I'd be leaving the studio late at night because I never worked eight hours. Eight hours, no, ten hours, no, twelve hours were pretty common. So I'd, I'd be leaving the studio very late. Um, and I'd see Pat, like, I remember very distinctly one time, he had a huge spread that he was doing. And he'd put in some characters, you know, his core members. And I said, dude, that's, that's good enough. You should move on. You know, you got more pages. I know how much work he had to get done. I said, you should, you should call it a day on this one. I said, yeah, yeah. Like, he put it aside. And he must have, as soon as I shut the door, he must have pulled it back out. Because <laughs> I got there the next day, and, like, he had filled it with core members. It's filled. I said, what the, you know, did you <laughs> get up all night drawing core members? And he was like, couldn't say no. But that's how he was. When he got an idea, he just executed to the perfection, right? to the most entertaining version that he could do. So we loved, I loved working with him. In fact, um, we shared a studio for many years. I, I moved further away. It was just not time effective for me to drive anymore, but I would still go up occasionally to work together. But while we did have the studio, then I, um, I wrote on a piece of paper and I, I put it on my, on my board, like some various ideas about like how to, how to turn the juice back up on my drawing. Like quit being so idle creativity wise and you know, start giving people more. And Pat inspired me to do that. 